Hey, everybody. Welcome to the MA Heat Podcast. I'm Karen Bryant. What's up, everyone? Alan Jovin here. So we were going to be in person today, but we had to do a media lunch with Robert Whitaker, which uh, we can get to uh, in a little bit. But just for, well, I may as well just tell you about it now. Anyway, the champ, <laughs> the champ is in great form, came in looking real sharp, had a nice suit and everything, obviously, because the Ultimate Fighter starts on Wednesday. So we had a nice media lunch with him. Um, it's already up on mmeheat.com and all that. Um, you know, he's such a, I don't know how you feel about him as a champ. I, I feel like you're a fan. I think he, I think he's such a classy guy. I think he's such a great representation of what uh, we want from a champion. And he doesn't trash talk. It's funny because there was a couple moments during the thing today where he doesn't trash talk, but you, he'll say one little thing, this little zinger, and you're like, oh, there's that incredibly confident man that, you know, that is the champion that has beaten some amazing fighters. Um, but he's so, he's so respectful, and I don't know, he just, he's just a good, good dude, and uh, I really like him as a champion. I think, he's, I think he's a good champ. He is. I mean, he's a good, he's a good champ, fights fun, yeah. he, he holds himself, like he said, and then I think it's good for the UFC as well, like, Having a uh, another international champion, yeah. you know, uh, from 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 out that way, he's bringing more attention to us and everything. But um, I agree, man. I I, I like him. He's a good dude. Um, mm-hmm. he's so I guess there was no talk. I mean, I don't think he would tell us anyway. But I guess there was no talk of injuries or he oh, seemed no, very was. happy. And yeah, confident. no, there's a lot of talk about it like right away because I've already watched the first episode of The Ultimate Fighter because I have tough talk so I get dibs on stuff so we already watched right. it um, and he does start to show off wearing a brace on his right hand uh, you can see the scar on his hand he actually goes into detail about what happened both his hands actually were hurt so um, it's been you know frustrating for him to have to deal with something there was ligament damage so he explains that kind of straight off right. uh, at the lunch and then he talks about sort of comparing that to the knee injuries and how the hands, um, you know, in a way are frustrating, but maybe not as much because at least he can still run. There's a lot of things he can still do to, to keep conditioned where, you yeah. know, the knee was more of a major thing. Uh, but no, he definitely talks about the injuries, you know, talks about fighting Yoel. One thing that's really interesting is he talks about um, when you're the fighter that makes weight and your opponent doesn't, how suddenly the fighter who makes weight sometimes is seen as the bad guy, right? And kind of pushed into a corner. Um, well, you're going to take the fight, you know, with the overweight guy and stuff. So he, he has actually got pretty animated about that. Yeah. Because, um, you know, when you guys, if your opponent missed weight, Alan, it's like you want to get paid and you, you trained and you want to make your money, but the other guy might have an advantage. And in a way, sometimes, yeah, you, the one who makes the weight starts to look like, you know, the bad guy if they say no, but they are the ones that did their job. Yeah, it's funny how that is. I get what you, I get what he means about yeah. that though, because if you made weight and your opponent didn't, then it brings more attention to you about is he going to take the fight? Is he going to ne- try to negotiate something further? Yeah. And uh, like you said, at the end of the day, it's 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 us taking more of the risk, yeah. and so we shouldn't be uh, frowned upon as some type of bad guy or somebody. Oh, he's not a real fighter. We're taking more of a risk. Uh, and we should be compensated if we wanted it. You know, we're going to save the promotion or save the fight or save the main event mm-hmm. because somebody else failed to uphold the contract that we will sign. Then maybe we should negotiate and figure out a way to get compensated more. So um, I get what he means by that. I mean, I think it's just the nature of the beast, the nature of the sport that, you know, uh, people are going to look, okay, because there's been so many fights that dropped out and didn't happen over the years or, or people that didn't make weight that now it's like, Almost every event now, when the when the car gets announced, you're like, "This is a beautiful car," and then you almost think right away, "Who's going to get injured yeah. and who's not going to make weight?" You know, because that's kind of the nature of the sport these days. Yeah, well, and to that end, you know, they're they're talking now about backup fighters and how Kamaru Usman is a backup fighter for Till versus Woodley. Um, so Robert talks a lot about that, kind of basically mm-hmm. why he thinks that idea is kind of ridiculous. And because basically, you know, like think about it, we, we were we were kind of making the comparison, like what if let's say he was training to fight Chris Weidman and Chris didn't make it, but Adesanya was the backup, right? He's like, how can you even how can you have a backup guy that's completely different or whatever, like totally not, you know, who you think you're going to fight? He's like. That point why don't we just say show up on friday and we'll pick a guy for you to fight you know so um I- interesting yeah. thoughts on that he had a, a really interesting take on that whole idea of the backup fighter yeah uh, you know what I-, I agree in terms of you if you are the title holder and then yet they throw you some random guy yeah it's much more dangerous for 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 the guy the guy who made with it and said that now pick up that fight but I totally agree with it. This is something that I think should have 
been in place a long time ago. Uh, Bodhi, my dog's crazy over here, just staring at me. Um, but because there's so many events that there's so much promotion and effort put into it, yeah. and then somebody doesn't make a uh, the wait, and the events to run off. So I think they always need to have these these backup guys in place. So if I heard you correct, you said Usman is going to make weight and be in place in case this fight falls through? That's the story. So if you look at his social media and everything, he's training like crazy. And, you know, um, uh, we were talking about this on the post fight show the other day. All of us are in good faith here that Darren is going to make it. But with Darren missing yeah. weight before, uh, you know, I guess there was some concern for that. So, um, you know, I feel like Darren is doing the right things and he's got a, He's at the PI and he's doing all the, he seems like he's doing the right steps to ensure that he makes it on the scale at the right weight for the fight. But yeah, it looks like Usman is, is going to be a backup. Uh, first off, I think this is, I think it's genius. I think it's brilliant. I'm very, very happy with that because the last thing you want is to say, Darren Till missed weight by seven pounds and Woodley did not take the fight. Now we have no main event. Now, yeah. The, 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 the pay-per-views suffer, the promotion suffers, the fans suffer. So even though it's tougher for Woodley to have to face somebody else, yeah. it keeps the event afloat and it keeps the momentum going. Um, and, and, you know, it, it brings up an interesting uh, decision as well. Let's say Darren Till comes in drastically overweight, seven pounds of weight. Because Woodley didn't say, I'm not going to fight the, the much heavier guy and mm-hmm. take the other opponent, or do I stick with the guy that I've I've, I've – train for and fight him even though he has an advantage um so it, it brings up an interesting um an interesting situation that the champ might have to make come that day well also let's not discount the fact that uh kamara usman is an incredible fighter but kamara usman is not the pay-per-view draw that darren till is right so then that's the whole other thing right it's like mm-hmm. well if you're a person who gets part of the, you know, the, the pay-per-view buys or if your, you know, paycheck is contingent on on sales and you're given two choices, mm-hmm. overweight guy with a big name who will sell more tickets or, you know, I mean, there's a lot that would come into play. Meanwhile, oh, yeah, you're supposed to be thinking about defending your title. Do you know what I mean? That, that it's, a, it's a lot to yeah. ask. I mean, I kind of like the idea of like what they're doing with, you know, uh, Connor and Habib. And having Tony and Anthony there, two guys in the same weight class, you know, Tony would be obviously the guy to take over if, you know, Habib or Connor didn't miss weight. Um, I think kind of stacking the cards like that is a good idea as well. Um, I got to think a little yeah. more on the on the backup fighter thing. Because, yeah, in theory, I want the fight to still happen. But I don't know if that's 100% fair to just shove a totally mm-hmm. different person in, um, you know, when a, when a fighter's been training to defend their title against a very specific opponent. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. So, so just to clarify as well, from what you know, Usman is just a backup. He's not, or he's not on that. He's not fighting anybody court, else. Correct? Yeah, supposedly he's just getting paid to show up and make weight. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. We'll so see. it would, you know, I guess also make more sense um, if they always had, which is tougher, but if they had another welterweight contender-worthy fight yeah. on the court already, that way the guy's already training. If everybody makes weight, he still gets to fight. You know, but it's tough right. to say, hey, go through an eight-week camp and pretend you're fighting for the biggest fight of your life, yeah. and there's a small chance that fight might actually materialize yeah. for someone like Usman. So that's kind of a tough thing to ask. I, I would hope that the UFC, and look, I, I kind of doubt it, but I would hope that the UFC would compensate that backup fighter yeah. who's putting all this on the line uh, and making weight. Because you got to think they're going through – if they're training for a fight, they're hiring the coaches, yeah. they're hiring the nutritionists, et cetera, et cetera. I hope that there is some type of small compensation happening for that. Well, yeah, supposedly there is, but there's other. The, also the other concern is, okay, so let's say you went through this whole camp, you're the backup person, you don't get the fight. So then how ready, how quickly will you get an actual fight then, right? Because you just made your body peak at a very specific time for nothing. Um, yeah. do they try to give you a short notice replacement somewhere else, super, you know, like close, close to that event? Like, you know what I mean? It just kind of makes a weird calendar too, for the backup fighter. How do I then schedule a quote unquote real fight for me? If I'm the backup on this one, like, you know what I mean? The timing, I would think that could get a little bit, uh, a little bit confusing for some people. It, it, it's, it's weird. You, for me, you would, you would have to think going back to, compensation yeah um that if yeah. they were going to say look we will give you uh close to your show purse if you yeah. do it then you know what it's like okay um let's say the average show purse in the ufc 
is somewhere between you know 20 and 50, then at least this fighter who put in a camp um, and did not get to fight has 30 grand, let's say, cut it in the middle, mm-hmm. uh, and he has money to say, okay, let me take a couple weeks off or stay with it and try to get a fight in the near future. But you have to say he peaked, and now he doesn't want to stay peaked for too long. Yeah. He doesn't want to get completely out of shape. But a little bit of financial compensation would ease those troubles, ease those burdens, allow him to say, look, okay, I'll stay ready, and if you can give me a short notice fight in the next six weeks, then I'll kind of stay ready for the next short term. Otherwise, yeah. let me know if I have like a three-month uh, deadline further down the road. But being compensated for it would, would you know, allow uh, alleviate that stress of having to, you know, stay ready or not. You get a little time to take off. You made some money. Yeah, and I, I apologize for not knowing all the specifics. I wasn't even thinking I'd end up talking about this today. So, but I, from what I understand, I believe he's getting. Come on, some money. I, I know we just. Yeah, we just, we just. Well, this was not. This is not part of the show, people. We weren't supposed to be talking about this, but I, I'm interested in this. This is yeah. an interesting topic because this is um, this seems to be the route that the, the, the UFC yeah. is taking, uh, the future of the sport where we've seen so many main events, um, yeah. dream cards fall apart, and we're trying to prevent that, or they're trying to prevent it, and I'm all for it. Um, I don't want these dream, dream matchups or big fights falling apart, so having these alternates in place to me is a smart move, but... You, like like we're talking about now, that's the reason we're discussing it because we need to have everything in play, the right person and yeah. alternate, making sure they're getting compensated. And if that fight doesn't happen for the alternate, what yeah. is next for them? So yeah. these are the things we're going to learn in these, these upcoming fights. Absolutely. Uh, what's uh, it? Wade? Uh, there was no winner for 360s also. Okay, yeah. Oh, so Wade was saying as we wrap up the uh, Whitaker discussion, the 360 video is also up um, so people can see. Um, no the uh, virtual reality one and you can pan around the room and see all of us there taking our notes and all that stuff too um yeah he's a good guy and i I feel like it was about what 35 minutes or so that we talked to him about half hour or so um and uh yes he's 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 a real good dude um and like i said i already watched the first uh, episode of the ultimate fighter uh it's heavy hitter so it's heavyweights and um featherweight women so it's the two heaviest weight classes for for men and women um and it starts off with a bang let's just say that uh, it starts with a bang, so uh, yeah. fun, fun fight in the uh, in the first episode. But yeah, so let's talk about uh, everything that went down um, in Lincoln. You know, we I can't remember. I mean, we guess we sort of did a pick right on the podcast the preview. I think we both thought Gaethje was going to win, right? I'm, anyway, I'm going to revise history and say that that's what we thought. But I'm pretty sure that's what we would have said, uh, even without me looking back on what we said, because I just figured that. Um, you know, he was just going to be able to, he, he works at a faster pace and I figured he'd be able to get inside and land on James and clearly he did. <laughs> yeah, you can say that again, Karen. He, he, he landed all right. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't remember if we did a pick for the entire show, but I think we both definitely picked Gaethje in that yeah. fight and, uh, boy, were we spot on on that one, Karen, um, it, it it was a dominant performance, obviously. It's not too. I, I didn't watch the post fight show, yeah. but I feel like you guys probably showed the instant replay about a hundred times. You don't know about Snap a Doodle Do, Alan. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like like I can only imagine trying to break down a thirty second knockout a yeah. hundred different ways. You know what I mean? And like it was, you know, he he just got in there yeah. and um he did a lot like uh, Darius did. He exactly. put him against the pressed him against the cage. He applied that pressure, and he found a way for those punches to land. He didn't stay in the middle and let um, – I'm, I'm blanking on an opponent's name. Um, James. Justin. Um, Gaethje, James, I'm sorry, yep. uh, James Vick. Uh, he didn't let him use his range out in the middle. Yep. Uh, Gaethje pushed him against the cage and closed the distance and did it in, in, uh, and put him away in dramatic fashion. Um, th- th- I was thinking about it today before we got on the air, and I was thinking – where does James Vick go from here? Yeah. You know, he took so long to build his record, to build uh, a, a great win streak in, yeah. in the toughest division. Uh, well, maybe tied with the welterweights, but it's a, it's a fairly <laughs> tough division. Very tough. Uh, in the UFC, very tough. So he, he built it. It took him a long time to build this momentum, to get this main event spot against a very tough fighter. Yeah. And I hate to say it, but he failed miserably. Where does he go from here? And and my thought process was that the, the best thing for James Vick to do right now, Karen, mm-hmm. is to take a page out of Algernon Sterling's book. Algernon Sterling suffered that devastating loss to, uh, you remember his name, the Brazilian? Marais. Thank you. Uh, Marais. 
that devastating knockout dropped him. And yeah. what did he do? It's tough to do, but he went and laughed at himself. Yeah. He 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 threw up memes of him dabbing. Oh, the dab, right? He, yeah. Uh, he was making jokes about it. Exactly the dab, and he laughed it off. You know what I mean? Yeah. He laughed it off, and he came back. And if I'm not mistaken, he came back and got a victory his last fight, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Aljo. Yeah. He did well. He did. So. I'm not saying this is something that I would be able to do if I got laid out like that in a matter mm -hmm. of seconds um, and was crushed by it. I think James wrote on his on his Twitter, this is the worst night of my yeah. life. I know how he feels. I would let him mourn this for about two days. It's about how long it takes to really get the, the, the real raw emotions away. Right. And then after that, rather than, than, than crying about all the tweets and Instagram and the hate that you're gonna, that he's going to get, mm -hmm. just laugh it off. If he could just say, you know what, I got laid out, Justin, put me away faster than this or that, right. make jokes about it, and say, I can't wait to get in there and do that to somebody else now. And and that's the only route he really could take and, take and be successful because if he tries to fight this, the haters are going to hit him very hard on social media and he's going to go into a, you know, depression or whatever. So, uh, I hope he can get through this. And, you know, he's going to be a guy that's going to come back and do well again in, in the mediocre slot. It's those main event guys, those tough top 10 guys that are give him a lot of trouble. Yeah, well, I think that's really what it is, is that, you know, he he did put together a great record and it is a tough division. But, you know, he makes enough mistakes um, that he could get by on the on the middle of the road, guys. But yeah, once you start getting into the elite fighters, right. they're better at capitalizing on those mistakes. And and you know, Justin at one point was eighteen and zero, and everybody talks about, oh, he goes in there and he'll take five punches to you know to give one. Um, but he does have a lot of experience. He's been in there with obviously former champions and champions, so he um, he, he you know he knows how to he knows how to exploit an opening, uh, which is what I definitely think happened. You know, it's funny to your point about uh, social media. Um, I saw something he all, James just posted something else and talking about his family and his baby and how he has all that positive stuff to look forward to. But at first he did say, he did kind of try to backtrack on the smack talk, you know, and he's like, oh, I was saying it to build the fight and to hype the fight. And I didn't mean it like I, I kind of wish he hadn't said that. Right. Because. That's one thing anyway, yeah. right? If you if you call your opponent a punching bag, if you say you're a B-level fighter, you're this, you're that, which he did to, to Justin, then you lose. I feel like you just got to own it. Hey, I called him a B-level fighter, a, a punching bag. My bad. I overlooked him. I, misunder I misunderstood the situation. Bad for me, learning situation. I, I don't love that he said he was doing it just to hype the fight. I wish he had just kind of stayed in the moment. Um, James is a good dude, you know, and I just felt like, I because I, I saw some responses to that, like people were kind of bummed out that he backtracked there. So I wish he just kind of let it be. Yeah. Uh, and like you said, yeah, take it, laugh at yourself if you can, learn from it and move on. Because, you know, people do have a short MMA memory. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, um, more fights are going to happen soon and, and people aren't going to remember it as some tragic thing for the rest of his life. Yeah, yeah. Well, if JC, if Gaethje stays as active as he does, yeah, it will probably be his main highlight. <laughs> yeah, James true. Vic, unfortunately for Vic, you're right. Um, you know, because Gaethje likes to fight a lot, and um, that will be the one that will always be played. True. Uh, and Gaethje's highlight reel, unfortunately for Vic, but but I agree with you, Karen. When when people talk trash, and it's disingenuous. A lot of times you sniff it out. Yeah. The fans sniff it out, and people like us who know the sport sniff it out. We sense that. We got a whiff yeah. of it early that this doesn't seem like James Vick. Right. The trash talk. It was a little uh, uncharacteristic. But you know what? It was good. It, it, they were one of the most it was good. Uh, heated rivalries yeah. at the presser uh, when they had the big press conference. Um, and so it was good. But like you said, just own it. Yeah. Just own it. If you can't make fun of yourself, like I did, uh, like I'm saying, maybe he should. Uh, don't go and backtrack and take back the bad words. Right. Because now it's like, so now it's like you were lying the whole time and you got knocked out. Now it's double whammy. Yeah. Now it's double words. She just got, like you said, own it, move on from it. Um, I don't like seeing that because even yeah. the, we know, we know that you guys are selling fights. We know that yeah. Shell Sun and is writing stuff down. We know right. that Kobe Covington probably has somebody writing it for him or he's making yeah. shit up but when you go and apologize 
or say it wasn't true or say it was just a phony, right. they were like, oh, well, shit, how am I supposed to get on the bandwagon ever again? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it's funny because uh, you bring up a good point about making fun of yourself and laughing at yourself. So maybe you saw this. Um, so on the post fight show, we were talking to Justin and, you know, it turns out when we were in the studio, we're, we're not, you know, we're not being, we don't think we're being filmed uh, while we're just sitting on the set <laughs> watching fights, right? The cameras are on, but the cameramen aren't really behind the cameras. So, well, it turns out that, you know, they do still like roll tape, right? So they always say you should be careful when you have a microphone on, just assume it's on. And, you know, when we're out there on set. So yeah. they they wanted me to show a, a footage like, hey, Justin, I know you can't see it, but take a listen to like Kenny and, and, and uh, Jimmy's reaction, right? And then they show the video on our show. And Kenny and Jimmy, we all freak out during that knockout, right? Because it was like one of those, oh, you know, crazy knockouts. So Kenny ja uh, grabs Jimmy's hand and stuff, but you hear me go like, oh, snap, right? Because, you know, I try not to swear a whole lot, right? But then I was like, a doodle do. Boom goes the diamond, right? Like so I'm just like saying ridiculous things because it's in the heat of the moment, like of the old crap yeah. moment, right? So anyway, I had no idea I even said that. And then that goes out to play on the on the replay of the thing, right? So then everybody is tweeting at me. They're like, uh, snap a doodle do. They're like, Kimmy, what the hell? Right? Snap a doodle do. And so this whole moment that was not even supposed to be shared with the world, because it was supposed to just be on the set where I'm supposed to have some peace yeah. and say what I want. Uh, ended up out into the world and so yeah. people are giving me grief about it and some people are like oh my god she's so cringe like dude if you like how can you be upset by that by something somebody said when they're not even expecting to be filmed and it's a total hilarious raw reaction of like somebody getting knocked out like I literally it's just funny to me that some people were like so unprofessional dude I wasn't on camera like what are you talking about and even if I was on camera Snap a doodle doo, man. You gotta just own it. <laughs> so unprofessional. Give me a break. What kind of nerd? Who cares about that? But oh, no. I didn't see it. I didn't even see that. So I'm gonna have to. Um, it's oh, funny. unless we're showing it here on the. No, we will. I don't think show. we will. It's um, on. Like, it's on. I gotta go back and watch. Gage. It's during the interview. I, uh, I if told you look my at, son you know, not to Fox interrupt me specifically. And uh, hey, little man. Okay, yeah, so it's pretty funny. Uh, it was one of those where people are like, you're never going to live this one down. Uh, I think it's pretty hilarious. But oh, I want to move on. on. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> we got a okay. special guest star okay. tonight. So cute. But um, yeah. the Feely Johnson fight. I'm curious what your take is on this one. It was a really, really close fight. Um, as was the Courtney Casey Angela Hill fight. Both of those fights went to split decision. This time, Andre Feely uh, was on the wrong side of a split decision. You know, he got the close call against Dennis Bermudez. That one went his way. This time it didn't, you know, against Michael Johnson. And you know, I couldn't bring myself to get really mad about this decision. I thought it was incredibly close. If Andre had won it, I would have been like, all right, cool, Andre won. You know, Michael was given it. And I believe afterwards, I can't remember my exact uh, numbers, but Michael did outstrike him, outland him a lot. Uh, I think what it was, though, is Andre looked to be sort of more physical in there. I, I think that's really where mm -hmm. kind of my brain was going with that. Um, and even though Michael landed on him, you didn't see him damage him too much, although he did send his head back a couple times. And, you know, it did look like it, a left could land on, on Feely and knock him out. I thought it was a good fight. It was a solid fight. But I, 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 I can't bring myself to be mad at the call. Yeah, uh, a bit surprising to me. Not not enough for me to say I'm mad at the call, but I remember finishing this fight thinking, you know what? I think Feely did enough to edge this one out. He seemed to have the to be the more aggressive fighter. He seemed yeah. to kind of control the pace. He was throwing a lot of a lot of head kicks and stuff. And I, I suppose that the 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 the, 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 the punch that weren't counting some of these kicks yeah. and things because it was surprising to me when you told me. That uh, that Michael Johnson had outstruck him and by yeah. a good amount. That was surprising to me, just because not counting the strikes, but yeah. watching the momentum of the fight, it seemed in my eyes that uh, Feely was doing enough mm -hmm. to uh, to get the win. But like I said, I, I don't think it was a robbery. I think it was one of these fights when I went to the judges. I thought, man, I think Feely did enough, but I really don't know. I really don't know which one, which way this is going to go. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong. Was the scoring a little funny? Did it go one judge, Michael Johnson, another judge, 30-27? Yeah, yeah. same thing in the in the Casey fight, I believe. There was like a 30-27, and then it's 29-28. It's like, dude, what fight are you watching? In neither of those fights, in my eyes anyway, was there a 30-27 ever? Exactly, exactly. Even if I, were, if I wasn't scoring 
one of those fights round for round. Right. I didn't see one fighter dominant throughout no. the entire fight. Not at all. These were close fights, and I, but, but um, it always surprises me when you have two 29-28s to uh, Michael Johnson and right. then a third 27 to Feely. Um, but that does tell you that that one judge was seeing something that the other judge didn't see. But, but I think that's a little uh, a little crazy to see all three rounds to him. But like I said, at the end of the day, it was a very close fight. Uh, he fought well, but Michael Johnson fought well as well. It came down to a split decision. The judges saw it the other way. It was close. I thought Feely edged it out, but he yeah. gave it to Michael Johnson. He can't be too mad at it because it was a very close fight. Yeah. And as you said, even though it has nothing to do with this fight, I agree that when he fought Dennis, it was the same type of fight yeah. where I thought, you know what, close fight, but Dennis did enough, and they gave it to Feely. Right. And I thought Dennis should have won that fight. Um, yeah. I thought Dennis did a little bit more. Me too. So he can't be too mad, although Feely's the guy that, that seems like he uh, doesn't hold back with his, his emotions. He's pretty pretty raw with you uh, and real. And um, and I like that about him. I mean, that's yeah. his style, his personality, the the, the gap in his teeth, yeah, I know. the tattoos. Um, yeah, you know, that's kind of like the swagger, the yeah. feel about him. So uh, so I, I expected him to be a little bit upset, to be yeah. honest. But I said, uh, not a robbery in any in any way. But I thought that Feely did edge that one out. Yeah, he got on social media uh, and thought he, you know, said something about oh. how he thought he won, and he said Michael hits like a bitch and the you know, commission can suck his Samoan, <laughs> you know what? You know, it's funny because I do, I just, yeah, Andre, like you said, we worked with him. The, he's a good dude. He's a cool dude. He, he's got a lot of attitude. And it's funny because after the Bermuda's fight, he was talking about how he's being more mature and taking things more seriously. And I do think he keeps improving. I mean, that dude can shoot a double. Like, I mean, his, his takedowns are fantastic. Um, I mean, he's really getting yeah. very, very good. I just think this time, you know, yeah, the judges just d- didn't give it to him. Um, but I think Feely has a great future still ahead of him. And yeah, he is still young. Um, that said, I feel like Michael needed that win way more than Andre did. Uh, you know, Michael's been on a skid and almost beat Darren Elkins in his first fight at 45. And then, you know, that one got away from him at the end. Like he was beating him up and then got choked out. And, um, you know, Michael's had some very close fights. I mean, the Habib fight wasn't close. But um, remember, this is a guy that beat Dustin Poirier. So Michael's just been on a tougher time lately. And I feel like he needed this win way more desperately than Andre did. Andre will be fine. If, if, if Michael had lost, that would have been a, a much more significant loss in his career than it is for Andre. I agree. I think Michael did need this win. You said it. The, the reasons behind yeah. he, uh, why he needed that win. He was on a bit of a skid. Changing weight classes. He needs to uh, assert himself in this new weight class and, yeah. and be able to start develop, developing some rhythm. And it's hard to do that yeah. when you go to a new weight class and you start losing. Uh, so I'm happy for him. Uh, Michael, if you're watching, shave that beard. <laughs> put a little uh, aftershave on there, man. I need, I need you to go back to that clean cut look man i don't know it was a bit scraggly it for was. me you were looking like a little bit like you were sleeping outside of the stadium from the night before or something man i'm sorry you fought good but you looked rough my man go shave that up get clean get polished really sharp like i know you can my man yeah i agree with you i was not feeling the scraggy beard paul felder's beard though by the way <laughs> oh my god Paul Felder's beard needed a performance bonus the other night. When he was calling the fights, did you see it? It was, like, so perfectly manicured, and it was, like, the beautiful copper red. The thing was on point. I, I thought I needed to adjust my television, Karen. <laughs> it was so bright red. I thought that, that my, my my tint was off on the TV or something, my, my lighting. I couldn't believe that his uh, beard could be so much more I red, I love red than the hair on his head. Um, yeah, I, it, it was weird because my wife was watching the fights with me and, she, and it took her a while and she's like, was that the guy? Because when I went to the Performance Institute yeah. before he fought Mike Perry, he was getting okay, worked yeah. on. I go, that's the guy that was sitting on the table next to me getting worked on. And she was like, it is? She didn't recognize him. That bright beard was something we've never seen. Who knew that his his beard got that red? But um, yeah, love he was it. on point, man. I love it. I love it. Well, the other close fight, uh, Angela and Courtney, um, again, kind of much like the Feely Johnson uh, fight. I yeah. wasn't mad at the call necessarily. Like they, it was a close fight. You know, I feel like I wish Courtney were more aggressive. 
Um, there's times when uh, I feel like she's you know yeah. landing, and we, we're all kind of frustrated by this. With both girls, sometimes they would kind of land on stuff and then retreat, you know, instead of just keep going forward. Yeah. Um, and I feel like with Courtney, the size that she has, and she's got a decent skill set, I just wish sometimes I just saw like a little bit more fire in her and a little bit more uh, of a spirit of going after it for her. But uh, I, she, she also was one of those people who needed a win. You know, she'd been on the wrong side of two split decisions. Uh, so it was good for her to get back on the winning track for sure and yeah that call I, I i didn't know who won uh and i was okay with it but 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 out of courtney i'd like to see a little more aggression yeah it, it was uh, another close fight as you mentioned okay. and uh courtney she's a tough girl man she um when we, when we were kind of doing the breakdown before this the yeah. last podcast that we did i was kind of saying that i'm a little more familiar with hill mm-hmm. than courtney and then watching her fight i remember man like this girl's good man she's got good hands she's um not in a disrespectful way, but she got like a big head. She you got know? a head. Like she, she got a jawline. She can take a punch. <laughs> she's got a, you know, yeah. she's got to fight. Like I notice those things when, when you're staring, when you're doing a stare down, and I see a fighter has like traps or a big, a big head or yeah. a wide jawline. Like these are things. These are features that that play into your benefit. Yeah. That you know that help you as a fighter, and it's intimidating. And you can see that in the fight, man. She was like the bigger woman in those areas yeah. against Angela Hill. But she fought really good. Uh, it was a close fight, but I think she deserved that one. Angela Hill, though, I'm still such a fan, man. I yeah, think she's, she's great. She, I, I like watching her. Like I said, the Andrage or whatever fight it was yep. that she had the fight of the night made me a real fan. And then uh, seeing her warm up in the dressing room, she's yeah. a very dynamic dynamic fighter. But you said it. She just needs to um, not always try to maybe um, – she needs to look, go, to, go for the kill a little right. bit more sometimes maybe rather than just – uh, being dynamic or putting on a fun fight. Um, maybe that didn't make sense, what I'm saying. Uh, because I know what you mean. I, I feel it's like, like the maybe work. she's a small... I feel like she's a... Right, right. She, she could be fancy and put on exciting fights, but sometimes being exciting and really going for the kill are two different things. Um, and I'd like to see her really like go for that knockout, mm-hmm. uh, which I'm sure she was... She, 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 if she was watching it, she'd say, what the hell do you think I'm doing? I'm trying. But... Uh, maybe change it up a little bit in terms of like sitting down on the power yeah. sometimes rather than being dynamic and fun. Well, and I think that really is the, the biggest hurdle for Angela is that she's just smaller. You know, she's just, I don't know. I don't know how much power she can get. I think, she, you know, she's just smaller right. than some of these other women. And, and I don't know, you know, how you can, I mean, obviously there are ways to build your power and that kind of thing. And like you said, sitting down on the punches more. And obviously uh, at Alliance, it's a gym that works so much on footwork. So she moves a lot. She moves great. She's in, she's out, she sticks and moves. But like you said, when you're, when you're in there, it'd be nice if, it, it, you know, cause she's not afraid of a firefight. Um, I just feel like, yeah, she no. doesn't, she's not able to hurt girls as much as others are able to, to tag her, even though she came away from that fight, uh, you know, relatively unscathed too. Yeah, no, I agree. That's kind of what I was trying to say. Like, I'd like to see her go for the kill, but she probably is. It's just like you said, at that weight class and with her frame, um, it's hard for her to really put girls away with yep. power because there's only so much power you could develop in that type of frame. Yep. So otherwise on the fights, um, you know, Jake Ellenberger uh, lost by TKO to Brian Barberina. Um, you know, Jake is a really great guy yep. that we first met in 2011, you know, training down at Rain. And I know, you know, he hasn't gotten the results he's wanted uh, lately. And I feel like for fans who maybe came to watching the UFC in the more recent years, they didn't really get to see Jake in his prime and understand why uh, he's so well-respected and so well-liked by everybody. I mean, this guy was a former Marine um, who always had a really great work ethic and a lot of discipline in the gym and just a really, really good guy. So even though I know he would have loved to go out uh, on a win in his home state, you know, he's born in Nebraska, uh, just definitely want to give Jake my best. And he, he really is a, a wonderful guy. And people should go back and look at some of his old fights. Look at Diego Sanchez. Look what he did to, you know, Matt Brown. Look, you know, Jake was in some really fun fights back then. And uh, definitely a good dude. Wish him the best in retirement. Yeah, he was that guy that was in, like, the top five for a minute. Yeah. Um, Heated back and forth with uh, Rory McDonald. Ended up being a bit of a snooze fest of a fight, but still win three rounds with Rory McDonald. The Diego Sanchez Sanchez fight was a war. He mentioned some of his fights that he will always remember, yeah. uh, and he had some big wins on some big cards. Um, he uh, it's funny when you look at his record in the last couple of years. Like you said, it, it doesn't really represent the type of fighter that he was mm-hmm. in his prime. Um, but of of a lot of those fights were losses 
Um, but of all of those losses and of those fights, the one big win that he took away was with against Matt Brown, who's always one of the toughest guys you're ever going to face. But when he needed to win the most, uh, he was on like a four-fight skid, losing yeah. streak. Dana White and them were telling him they were going to cut him. He flew to Vegas. He told Dana, give me one more fight. They gave him Matt Brown, of all people. When you want one more fight to prove yourself and they throw you Matt Brown, you're like, what the? Are you guys trying Wait, to throw me trying to the kill bus? me right now? He won- Exactly. With all that pressure on his back, about to lose his job, and, and, and against one of the toughest, most intimidating fighters in the welterweight division, and knocked Matt out. It was a liver shot, but he knocked Matt out, yeah. kept his job, uh, and, and that kind of showed me a little bit about, more about who he was. And then just his parting words uh, in the octagon, post-fight interview with the interviews um, outside of the cage, um, speaks very well, very intelligent, didn't let his emotions overtake him. He was just very genuine about everything and um, a likable guy, a likable guy. Yeah, very much so. Um, curious, uh, other finishes of the night, Eric Anders got that late uh, head kick KO, which was ridiculous. That, 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 was, was, that was like, and it's funny because right yeah. before he landed that kick, there was another one, like Tim Williams fell down and they're like, oh, was that a, was that a slip or a knockdown? And they're like, they were still trying to debate whether that was, and they were like, oh, no, that's, that's the fight is over now. So we don't even really need to debate what just happened. Eric knocked him into tomorrow man that was crazy that was dope i i think i went i i probably went just as nuts for that finish as i did for the geishi right, right, right. over james vick finish just because like you don't always see those like head kick knockouts and, and you know right. to be honest i remember as soon as it happened uh thinking okay i don't care what if his hand was down or not that is fair because he was in the process of getting up so i don't care what the instant replay shows yeah but then that was my second thought was before the show happened, they mentioned instant replay will be in effect tonight, and it will only be used if the it was a fight ending uh, a moment right. that that, uh, that ended the fight. Which and so this was the perfect example of of a time to use instant yeah. replay. Uh, we weren't sure if his hand was down or not, um, and, and, and the fight ended obviously. And I'm glad that we have into replay now that we're catching up to the other sports. Mm-hmm. If there's a, a a momentum swing in a fight that we can go back and ref, and, and refer to the into replay and yeah. see what the right call was. But aside from into replay, whatever they would have chose that night, it was fair. It was yeah. fair, and I'm glad they didn't change anything because he was in the process of getting yep. up. So even if his fingertip would have still been on the mat, his mindset was, "I'm getting up." Right. A grounded opponent means that I'm. I'm grounded and I'm yeah. in the process of trying to stay down. He was trying to get up. They made the right call. Head kick knockout, spectacular fashion, and just what he needed because, look, totally. the fight was kind of a letdown, to be honest. Yeah. He comes off of a main event, a loss to Lota Machida, but we're thinking, wow, what are we going to see out yeah. of him after main eventing five rounds against one of the greatest in the world? He's got to have show so much improvement, and he, he seemed to be a bit tentative in the yeah. fight. I forgot about all that, Karen. I forgot about the tentativeness i forgot about him not really pulling the trigger all i see when i saw that fight is that head kick yeah. knockout it was sick yeah it was crazy and i'm curious what you thought before uh that in the feature prelim with james kraus and worley alves you know you and worley obviously have shared the cage before and wow. everybody going in this was wondering is james going to be big enough because he's coming up to 75 uh, or 170 rather from 55 and worley's a big dude is james going to be able to like handle that size again yeah. you know uh, yeah, the answer is yeah. <laughs> so I was thinking you probably were impressed with that finish. I was really impressed. Yeah. He did a great job, man. He was um, James is a smart fighter. Um, you've seen him cornering people on yeah. the contender. Um, he, he he's worked the desk with you over at Fox. Mm-hmm. He's a uh, he's an intelligent guy. He has a a coach's mindset. Yeah. Uh, a lot like myself. I could tell when we've talked and hung out before. And the way that he talks about fights, he's a fighter, but he also coaches. So he knows how to tell you to do A, B, C. And then he looks at stuff from an analyst's point of view. If I, Even though he was a 55er, he was a taller, rangier yeah. fighter. And what did he need to do in that fight? He needed to just stay at range and pick Worley apart and not let Worley use that big first-round momentum that he does on everyone. Yeah. He did just that. He got out of the guillotine. He, he picked Worley apart. He made Worley get frustrated because Worley obviously is a tough guy, but he's a guy that kind of kind of shows a little bit of quit once you put him through a yeah. t- uh, past the first round. 
He does, Worley's the guy that doesn't like to fight rounds two and three. Okay, right. James made Worley go into those deeper waters, pick them apart, timed a beautiful long knee. Um, and, and as soon as I saw that knee land, I was like, he's hurt, he's hurt. <laughs> James jumped on him, put him away. It's crazy. You said it. James is a guy going up yeah. from 55 to 70. Worley's a guy going down from 85. They met at 70. James showed him who the man was. It was an impressive fight by him. Sure, sure did. Uh, the other fights that were standouts, like Davis and Figueredo um, beat uh, John Moraga. That was pretty badass. Um, that was a TKO there. Yeah. I'm glad for uh, I didn't have anything against Kalinda, but I know Joanne Calderwood really needed uh, a win, and for her to get a submission was kind of a big deal. I did not expect her to get a submission. Um, and uh, yep. your boy... Your boy, Mickey, go- oh, I'm um, sorry, before we get to Mickey, though, how about Corey Sandhagen in that arm? Dude, how the hell did he survive that round the, one with Yuri the fight on the Like, what? What? And, I mean, that was insane. That was the fact insane. that he survived that, then the fact that he comes back and just wrecked Alcantara. And thanks, ref. Hi, how about stopping that fight? Like, I don't know, 97 punches sooner? God, yeah. you know. Then, luckily, they pulled that ref from the rest of the night. But that, that was hard to watch at the end of that. I heard that. So, so please brief me on that, Karen. So I heard you guys say that during at some point during the show. First off, amazing fight, amazing comeback, and amazing that he broke his nose with yeah. a hammer fist on the ground. Yeah. Uh, and it was bloody crazy bloodiness after that. Survived, came back, awesome fight. The ref yeah. was a little bit late on that one. Yeah. So what happened? The commission ended up pulling so, yeah, him because, and he was you know, supposed to ref more fights? Yeah, he was that actually that same ref was supposed to later on be refing Angela and Courtney. And whether it's just because it was women and they didn't want to see two women get in those same positions of, of uh, uh, you know, close to death uh, or what. But um, basically there was a judgment call made that that guy wasn't uh, good at his job. So they didn't let him ref the rest of the night. I mean, and it is tr- <laughs> tricky, right? Because, you know, in the first round, Corey's arm is hyperextended, this and that. It's bent all weird. You know, you think his nose is broken, like you said, all that stuff. Like you think... A lot of refs might have stopped it then, and then it's like, okay, well, when he turned things around and he was putting the beat down on Yuri, was the ref thinking, well, I gave him a chance before to fight out of it. I guess I should give Yuri a chance to fight. You know what I mean? But I don't know what it was, but Alcantara was giving, like, he was done fighting a long time before uh, the ref stopped that. Even, even I, I remember this fight ended in the second round, correct? Think is so, that, yeah. Is that think, right? Do you remember that? I think it was second. Second yeah. round, because I remember. Oh, no, it definitely I'm pretty was. Sure it I definitely remember, was the second. Yeah, yeah. Because I remember at the end of the first round when Erie was getting beat down yeah. and the bell rang, and I remember getting up and I was watching the fight with my with Cage. Yeah. And I told him, I said, this guy doesn't want to fight anymore. He's like, why? I was like, you could see it in the guy's yeah. eyes when the round's over and he thinks, I don't want to be in here. You could see that he wasn't right. in here. And if the ref would have taken initiative and gone to the corner and say, fighter, are you, do you still want to fight? Do you want to be here? Right. I bet you he probably would have said, I don't want I no response or I don't want to be here or something. But he went out back out there, took a bit more of a beating. But you know what? Speaking of initiative, uh, I'm proud of this commission. I'm proud yeah. of this commission for stepping up, taking initiative. They saw something. They saw a flaw in the referee. And they said, we're not going to allow him to go and tarnish our commission, our name, our state that represents us any further on any other cards. Let's take him out of here. We'll assess what he did wrong with them and yeah. put somebody in his place. Um, a couple of things that we said on this show today shows me that the sport is moving in the right direction yeah. with the with the, with the uh, answer replay, with the, ref, uh, the commission taking initiative. Yep. And then, uh, like we talked about uh, in the top of the show, with the uh, having alternate fighters mm-hmm. for the big shows for in case people don't make weight. Uh, these, in my eyes, are all great decisions and good calls and, uh, and moving the sport forward. We just need judges that understand the difference between a 30-27 and a 29-28. <laughs> That's the last thing. If we could just get these judges on the same page now. Right. Yeah. So how how fired up were you for your boy, Mickey Gall? Folks should know that you and Mickey have trained together uh, out at Muscle Farms. How psyched were you? So so this this fight was a good fight for him, a good yeah. matchup. Um, his opponent, uh, George, was it George, George Sullivan. Uh, yeah. Sullivan? Yeah. George Sullivan. He's a guy that um, been in the UFC a little bit longer than me yeah. and really stays under the radar because he's kind of like here and there, here and there. Yeah. Um, not to talk down on him, but he's a guy. He's a guy that's very, very beatable. But mm-hmm. he's a tough guy too. But Mickey Gall, uh, as as green as he is as a fighter with a record of like five and one, yeah, he's a very 
he's very not green on the ground. I've right. trained with him a bunch. And the first time we rolled, he put me in a rear naked choke in about two minutes. The second time, he got me with uh, a, um, a Dars. Oh, and no, no. Right away, Mickey's good on the ground. But the, but the rear naked choke and the Dars are his go-tos. Yeah. And once I got good at defending those, then we had much more competitive roles. So I know now when I roll with Mickey, if you get your back, you're in a lot of trouble. You got to really, really, really – you can't let him get one step ahead of you. There's yeah. no making up. If he gets one step ahead of you, you got to uh, gotta fix that right away. I saw when he got the back, I told I told my son Cage, uh, I'm, I'm educating him in these fights. I said, look, this guy's done. He's done. George was being a little bit too relaxed on yeah. the ground. It's good to be relaxed, but you have to be relaxed and assertive. I felt like George didn't do his research and – if I was fighting Mickey Gall, although I do have the benefit of training with him, I would know you need to just work on back yeah. defense. At the end of every of every uh, class or session, you need to just play, do Shark Tank. Have four guys, right. four black belts right. on your back in a row, and you just fight your way out of it. George didn't seem like he put in that effort, and I don't know if he did or not, but watching the fight, he looked a little bit too much not like, like, like okay, I've been here before. But Mickey is a high level. It's like having a Gunnar Nelson or somebody on your, on, yeah. on your back. He's high level on the back, and he finds ways. And he's also good at using both hands. He can mm -hmm. use either hand to finish you, and, and, and that puts a strain on you because you're kind of uh, tweaking your body to go right. one way, and the other hand comes and cross faces and goes in. Needless to say, I'm talking a lot of technique, but at the end of the day, Mickey went in there, and I think they said it. He took out George Sullivan faster than he took out CM Punk. Yeah. And it was a, a big win for Mickey and a, a, a pretty big black eye for George. Yeah, it was a great win for him. I have to say, I mean, I like when a fighter gets in and out of the cage uh, without getting hurt, but I know he's been working with Joe Schilling. I know you guys have been putting in work. So I kind of wanted to see, you know, his stand-up a little bit. I wanted to see Mickey, you know, let things go a little bit. But obviously, Me you know, too. yeah, the bread and butter I is know. the jiu-jitsu. But I, I was kind of curious to just see, um, you know, because Joe's such a badass. Like, I was just kind of curious to see what, what developments Mickey has made there. I'll have to wait till the next one. I know. I, I, the same with me. I mean, me and Mickey punch each other in the face for, for, for 10 weeks. Right. I wanted to see what was going to happen. We didn't get to see it. I think, And I think Joe Schilling even said, like, he was promising a knockout. Yeah. And he's like, so uh, I guess uh, there was no knockout. But we'll have to get on the next one because, yeah. you know, Flawless victory right there. So it's a good job. You know what's funny? After that fight, I remember thinking, Mickey's probably in the running for a bonus. He's got to be back there yeah. thinking, oh, yeah, baby. Whatever that was, 29-second finish, I'm getting that bonus. Yeah. And then fight after fight after fight delivered that card, Karen. And yeah. every fighter, I know when I do a good – when I have a good fight, I go in the back. I'm in the green room eating, and I'm watching the TV thinking, ooh, don't be exciting. Don't finish them. Be boring. <laughs> Don't get knocked out because I don't want any fight to steal my money. And right. that's how every fighter thinks. They want that money. And um, I bet you Mickey and every other fighter yeah. uh, was sitting back there thinking, oh, my God, <laughs> another finish, another knockout, right. another fight of the night. It was a great card. It delivered. I knew it was. this is one of those cards, yeah. like the Dustin Poirier card, like this card, um, these free cards on, on yeah. Fox Sports 1 with a bunch of solid fights put together. These are my favorite type of cards. Yeah, it really was great. Um, and yeah, same same thing. We kind of knew going in, there were some good matchups, there was competitive, people had stuff to prove, and so people were going to put it out there on the line, uh, and they definitely did. So yeah, I, I was cool with it. And I should say, and I said this in, on, on, on Twitter too, but you know, um, with people seeing that video of us reacting to uh, Gaethje knocking Vic out, like just so people know, we react like that, no matter who's on the receiving end. It's like, we, you know what I mean? It's like, if you see a knockout, it's just like, oh, snap. So it's nothing personal. It's not about like, because somebody's like, oh, you're biased. It's like, no, I'm not I'm not even thinking about who, who that is on the receiving end. You know what I mean? It's just like, if you're a fight fan and you see some ridiculous knockout, you're just like, oh, you know what I mean? So uh, for anybody yeah. who thinks that we are in there and we're like really, you know, picking favorites and mad when our, I mean, it's not like that at all. It was just a, it was just an old knockout. That was uh pretty amazing. It's a natural reaction. To, <laughs> to, 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 it, 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 it's like those videos you see on the internet when they got like five dudes and they're all, and they're all, and they're all like, Oh yeah. It, yeah. You, you're going to react. Hold on. I think I lost you guys a second, but Oh no, I see you still knockout no matter who it was. 
Unless it's somebody you really know and right. you're close to and you're like, oh, oh, you should know. Yeah. But other than that, I did the exact same thing. I, j- I was jumping up and down. Um, and, and I'm not close to Gaethje or, or, yeah, or Gaethje. Yeah, no, I had just, zero it, it was, it was Look, yeah. uh, to, two parts to a knockout, you know, the, the contact and then the way that they fall. Yeah. And this, this knockout had both of them. Right. It was a dramatic punch, but the, the way that he fell was – was even more dramatic. It was like chopping down a tree. Right. He went down. Uh, it was a long drop, and his eyes stayed open. I mean, it had everything you want in a, in a beautiful knockout. So you're going to react to it. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, listen, the summer is coming to a close. It's Labor Day weekend this weekend. There's no uh, fights, but then the next one up is Till and Woodley. So uh, Wade will be going to a media lunch on Thursday with the champ, Tyron Woodley. Uh, so we'll have that footage up. And on Wednesday, like I said, UFC tonight, we, we have UFC tonight and Tough Talk. Kelvin Gastelum's going to come in with us uh, and he's going to be on for both shows and that kind of thing. So that'll be good. I'm hoping he gets another chance at the punching machine because the first time Kelvin was there, I'd, he didn't do so great. And I think it was kind of during fight week and all. And I think he was like, you know, didn't want to let everything go and stuff. So I think uh, hopefully we'll let him get another chance uh, and get a better score. But, um, but yeah, I'm excited. You know, like I said, I've only watched the first episode so far. I know a lot of people like kind of think that the uh, the uh, ultimate fighter is long in the tooth, which, you know, whatever it is and it isn't. But uh, Robert was saying some interesting things just about, you know, now that it's men and women, the dynamic of, of um, training both men and women and stuff. Uh, it is interesting. So you heavyweight men, featherweight women. And uh, yeah, so it's going to be fun. So I'm looking forward to Tough Talk, me and Bisbing at it again. Uh, so that's always good stuff. So that's what I have going on this weekend. You are doing uh, UFC now with me, I think, this Thursday, right? I think we're on UFC now on cool. Thursday, so we'll be doing that, yeah. Awesome, awesome. In other words, the car, truck's running well. People can find you out on social media and in Black Betty. Does she have her own account yet? Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't. It might, it might be coming soon once I get all the little details finished. But the truck's running good. I finally took her on, like, uh, since I've been building this, I've been saying, like, I just want to go drive through the hills. Yeah. I want to go on the PCH. I want to do all those things that, like, you know, beautiful – beautiful countryside yes. places that are fun to kind of go and drive and and look at the scenery and we did just that this week and we went driving into the Panga hills and hit the pch and hit the santa monica pier and uh really enjoying my truck now so it, it's fun to like get to actually enjoy it without the anxiety of breakdowns and this and that so um it, it's coming along and, and it, it's a ton of fun right now awesome awesome all right well so on instagram i'm kb heat Everywhere else you can find Karen Bryant. You can also look for MMA Heat. As I mentioned, we have the Robert Whitaker lunch, uh, and Wade will be getting one with Tyron later in the week. And, uh, and yeah, so that's good. So thanks for watching. Alan, where can everybody find you? At Alan Jobin, guys. Nothing changed. Check me out. Cool. All right. Well, folks, I hope you guys are enjoying the end of your summer. Hope everybody has a safe Labor Day. Don't be a – just don't drink and drive, people, please. <laughs> please don't do it. Yeah. But, yeah. Enjoy yourselves, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Enjoy yourself. Be safe.